No, thank, th thank you for that, and thank you for inviting me to, to the conference. It's great to be here, and can I just say that it's great to see uh, Python logo beamed uh, up on the big screen there, um, all over the uh, stadium grounds. So it's great to see a good smile on my face from the whole team. So what I'm going to talk about today is exhibit and synthetic data. Um, first, I'll sort of give a bit brief introduction to synthetic data. I'll try not to repeat what David already sort of covered in terms of the use cases, etc. Um, then I'll sort of look at the exhibit features and use cases uh, for what it was developed. I'll try to fit two live demos um, if I can, uh, but we'll see how we're doing for time. And then there's Q&A and um, some future plans for exhibit. So what do we talk about when we talk about synthetic data? Um, and the key takeaway from here is that I think there's not one synthetic data, it's a spectrum. Um, and Office for National Statistics put out a really nice graphic um, illustrating that, uh, showing sort of how synthetic data goes from sort of structural level to a replica level. And as the um, granularity and the level of detail um, increases, so does the analytical value, but also the disclosure risk. So the closer your synthetic data is to the real data, the more controls you have to put around it to make sure that the information is not leaking and to make sure that um, the patient identifiable information is protected. Another point is that synthetic data is typically uh, context and domain specific, and so are the challenges uh, and the approaches that you might take when looking at um, synthetic data. So generating synthetic data for images, for example, will be completely different to generating it for text or for just your, your, your standard sort of relational sort of table style uh, data. And synthetic data needs to evolve just as the real data or the products evolve. So if you've built a dashboard um, that uses synthetic data and then some visualizations change over time, then you need to rebuild that synthetic data to make sure that your dashboard is still uh, looking good. And one thing that I sort of think about when I sort of think about synthetic data is that it's about replicating the logic uh, behind the data. So that your data types, your distributions, relationships, rather than data, the data itself, data points themselves. And of course, there'll be synthetic dra dragons out there. Um, source control um, and observability sort of making sure that you know all the steps that your uh, crown jewel of uh, confidential data sort of takes all the, all the way to the synthetic um, stage. Stakeholder trust and explainability of the algorithms that you apply to uh, generate the synthetic data. And again, this sort of has to be almost uh, done in two steps and for two audiences. One is the technical audience, and another one is more on the information governance side, on the policy side, where you need to explain in, in plain English what uh, you've done to ensure that the, uh, the confidentiality is protected. Data linkage across multiple tables, uh, particularly involving time, is very challenging, as is um, sort of preserving row level relationships in your data. So an example would be if you have a hospital stay consisting of multiple episodes, you want to preserve that relationship in your synthetic data, and it's not straightforward to do. It's much easier to preserve column by column relationships than it is to do row relationships. And with multiple tables, again, the challenge there, for example, is if you have a table with patient information that includes date of death, and you have admissions table, and you don't want to have patients who are uh, have passed away in one table, you know, appearing as new admissions in another. So there are challenges there. And you know, some tools like SDB, for example, they will they will typically sort of join those tables and then sort of disaggregate them. So there, there are approaches there. And then of course accidental matches and disclosure control. Um, to give you an example, in Scotland there's a community health index number, each patient is given that. And it has a certain logic to it. So it includes uh, patient date of birth, uh, a code for a cipher for um, their, their gender. So if you're using synthetic data approaches to synthesize chi numbers, 
it's pretty much inevitable you're going to have collisions with the real, real stuff just through business logic, if you follow that business logic. Um, so that creates extra dangers um, when, when, when looking at it. So exhibit, what, why, who, and how. Um, exhibit is a sort of a, is a Python command line tool. Uh, it generates uh, data from a set of user instructions that are stored in a text edit editable file, in a YAML format. So it's human readable and editable. The original purpose uh, behind sort of exhibit was to help uh, with sort of dashboard presentation because I was in a team that was uh, going out to events promoting our dashboards that were using confidential data and we had quite a few dashboards, quite a few data sets and rebuilding those um, data sets that would be okay to show to external audience was a challenge. And this sort of gets around the problem of sort of handcrafting these anonymized data sets using uh, new code every time you sort of have a new data set to tackle. Exhibit is fast, it's flexible, and it doesn't require any programming knowledge to use. And that's another, um, I guess, differentiating point uh, from some of the, of the other tools, is that you, it's a, it, all you need is a text file, and you edit that, and the conditions that you put on your synthesis, they're expressed in natural language. So you want to say, okay, make this column the same, so make the values in this column the same. So you don't, you don't have to write any code for that. So that's abstracted away. And as sort of the project developed, I've realized that there's also room for more advanced users who would want to use Exhibit as an importable library to be integrated into uh, existing scripts. So there is that functionality as well. So key features, um, you can rapidly iterate on synthesis options. So if something doesn't work, it doesn't tell the story that you want um, with synthetic data. You can just change a few parameters and then rerun it, and it's, it's, it's very quick cool work. You can create custom distributions using weights and probability vectors. You can use regular expressions to anonymize, sort of to create almost like lorem ipsum style um, fields. If you want, for example, to test load volumes, sort of, uh, then, then you can basically create a lot of uh, uh, text fields uh, really easily and quickly. You can add columns derived from newly synthesized data. Um, so an example, I'll show, you, I'll show you an example of that later. Um, you can preserve relationships, and relationships could be sort of paired, hierarchical, they could be custom relationships, so that you, for example, ensure that um, in the sort of example that David uh, used earlier, you know, that certain age groups will only have, uh, ever have uh, certain diagnoses. Um, and again, this is something that you can learn with a machine learning model, but it's, you already know that. You already know that logic. In the same way that you already know that, you know, uh, discharge date follows the admission date, not the other way around. So you don't need to uh, learn that, you just need to specify it. You can add outliers to any subset of the generated data. So this is again helps with the storytelling. Um, and again, when you, depending on your use case where you use the synthetic data, if you're using it in a dashboard, you want to uh, show how your dashboard sort of draws the insights from the data. And you almost plant those um, insights into your data, into your synthetic data. Or for example, if you're a researcher and you're testing a hypothesis, you can insert the, um, the, the, that hypothesis into your synthetic data to make sure that if your code finds it, well, you know it's there because we put it in there. So then when you run that analysis on the real data, if it finds it, well, that's good. Um, you can also generate geospatial uh, data using H3 um, hexes. Um, an example of that would be something like this where you can basically create uh, Latin long pairs for, say, GB practices based on the number of sort of regions that you, you set. So if you have health boards and you want to create fictitious GB practices but want to locate them in realistic places, then, then you can do that. Um, you can augment synthetic data with compiled machine learning models 
and custom functions. So you can combine some of the simpler sort of methods with more advanced methods and, and sort of mix and match. So how do I, how do I get sort of my hands on it? Um, you can install it with pip, so pip install, um, exhibit, and if you want to have access to all the latest um, changes, you can also just um, clone the repository from GitHub, get it, get it, get it, get it that way. Um, I've just updated it just in time for the for the conference, so it should have all the uh, all, all the update things in there. Um, how do you actually use it? So once you've uh, installed it, it has a fairly slim list of dependencies, so it's not going to bring like everything. Um, in the folder, in the demo folder, I have an inpatients data set, uh, which, which I've downloaded from, from the web, so it's op 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 open data. And it's a data set that is at quarterly, quarterly, quarterly level, so quarterly level, um, individual hospitals in Scotland with a code, couple of measures, then number of stays, length of stay, average length of stay, and then some, some, some patient details. A um, couple of things sort of that are notable about this data set is that the some of the relationships. Um, you have the paired relationships with the health board code, health board name. You have hierarchical relationships with one health board, many hospitals. You have dependency sort of column that is average length of stay, which is length of stay divided by stays. Um, and then you have obviously the date field. So when I press um, exhibit, uh, from data inpatient CSV. If I don't give it any additional parameters, and there's 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 a um, there's a sizable list of them that you can sort of customize um, what comes out. It will produce a um, YAML file that looks like this. which is a specification. And it will have a number of sections, uh, and I'll sort of quickly go through them um, to give you just a brief, 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 brief of what they, what they do. So you have the metadata, which is just the number of rows, the types of columns that you're seeing in the data set. Um, you have the random seed. So one thing about exhibit uh, is that once you have the spec nailed down, if you run that spec again and again, you will always be guaranteed to get the same data sets out. So it's, it's great for reproducibility. Um, each column type has its own sort of subset of parameters. So for categorical columns, you'll have um, sort of this original values uh, parameter, which will have all the, all the values um, for that column, their probabilities, and the weights for the numerical columns for each of the values. So in, in, in this case, for example, um, all, all things, all other things being equal, the length of stay for this age group will be much greater than for, for, for this age group. But of course, you know, these things will interact between each other. You have the number of unique values, you have the missed probability, which means that you can introduce missing data uh, if that's what your tests require. So for example, if you have a scenario where you are testing for the presence of null values, and how your system copes with that, you can introduce that artificially. But of course, you know, there are, there are, there are different um, null values which, which, we'll, which we'll cover. There's a paired column, and that will appear here with the paired values. Sometimes you'll have more uh, values than you can sort of practically look at in a specification. So like for this location name and code, there are 48 hospitals. So rather than list them all there individually, they're sort of stored in a database that, it, that comes with exhibit. For um, in numerical columns, you have some distribution parameters, uh, so you can target the scaling of those, of those values to either target minimum or maximum or the sum. Um, you can, uh, again, introduce misses, uh, like the nulls, null values. For dates, you can control the frequency, the number of unique values, the probability. And another useful option there is that if you want to build complete time series, so if you want to, for example, in your visualization, you want to 
uh, toggle between different sort of categorical values, but you always want the complete time trend. So setting the cross join values um, to true means that you know there's always going to be a value for that. So that's the um, sort of the columns section of the specification. There's also constraints um, allowing duplicates or have some, having some basic constraints with uh, one column values in one column being always greater than values in another column or custom constraints. And there's a number of them, uh, like making null, making not null. This is useful, for example, if you have two columns, like readmissions within seven days, readmissions within 28 days. You know, if you have readmission within 28 days, the readmissions within seven days can't be null because you know that will at least have one in there. So some of these will, we, we would make um, creating those patterns a lot easier. There's linked columns in this case, um, help board name and location name, and derived columns. As I said, you can do like average length of stay. Um, I'm not going to cover sort of too much more around. Um, that specification, but there, there's, there's, there's a lot more you can do. And you can see from the parameters, for example, if you want to erase all the distribution information, you can set the uh, equal weights flag uh, in the command line, and that will make sure that uh, all the weights, all the probabilities, they're all uh, equalized. So that uh, all that um, specific information is erased. Um, I wanted to show quickly the way to uh, use exhibit as a script and you export you, you, you import the library you uh, create an empty specification which is a dictionary that looks like this which is very similar to the YAML sort of spec that I showed earlier you set the number of rows that you want and in this case well what, what I sort of demoed here is imagine that for this conference you know we, we want to generate um, data around how, what people tweet about and we have uh, we, we can start with just the user IDs, so let's have some user IDs, and we'll set the frequencies uh, so that most people sort of will tweet one, two or three times, but there is a small uh, percentage of people who will tweet ten. So um, if we generate that data set, we have, okay, so that's, that's our data set with just two columns, and then we can sort of start building on that. Uh, we can add the channel with just one original value, so Twitter. We can then add track, R or Python, with probabilities, so that we have more R tweets about R than, than Python. Uh, we can then sort of add text, and that's that um, regular expression that I talked about. We add the number of likes um, between zero and 100. And then we sort of um, add the date, and the date column will be just day level, four days. So we add those, uh, we generate the data, that's how it looks. It takes seconds to generate 10,000 rows of that data. Um, of course, there are some rules to that, sort of in that scenario, so that your user name is uh, matched to user ID, so you have to make sure that they're the same. So we basically say, okay, for each user ID, the target column user name has to be the same. And for the tweets, we sort of make it almost the same, so that typically people will tweet about the same sort of thing, so we'll want to add that as well to the mix. When we do that, it takes slightly longer, but not by much, and then what we'll see is that, for example, for this user, um, they've tweeted mostly about Python, but there's a bit of R in there, and then that person um, was unlucky enough to have zero likes for his tweets. Um, so that's how you can use exhibit in a script. Uh, and I've only got what's next for exhibit, which is to look at sort of changing the specification from YAML to HTML to make it a bit more user friendly, investigate streaming generated sort of data, and the usual bug fixing, performance improvements, and more. Because software is never finished. Thank you. That was the opinion.